So, maybe this is my last chance to speak to you all. So, maybe I should just say, I would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful opportunity to be part of this very unique experience. Not only part of the experience during the call, during the workshop, but also part of it before the workshop. I mean, the intensity of the organization was already felt through the emails I was getting since two months. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. So, okay, so today I'll discuss, um, start with a discussion of so called effective Hilbert, uh, Hilbert's, 19, uh, Hilbert's 17th problem. So, <clears throat> so you just take a function in rational function in n variables and suppose it is f is positive semi-definite. <coughs> that means uh, wherever uh, it makes sense uh, the values are non-negative then the, the question was is f a sum of squares in rx in this field rx and x2. <coughs> So this was the, the question of Hilbert, uh, which was essentially answered by Emil Artin in the 1920s. The answer was yes. In fact, every positive semi-definite function is a sum of squares. Of course, the next natural question is sum of how many squares? Suppose you fix the number of variables, can you effectively bound how many numbers are, how many squares are required to express a function. So the solution came from Pfister's theory of Pfister forms, uh, effective Hilbert 17. So he asserted that if you have n variables, then every, um, uh, every uh, in fact, he, what Pfister shows is that every sum of squares is a sum of, can be expressed as a sum of 2 power n squares. That's the maximum number required to write any function as a sum of squares. Okay, so maybe I'll just briefly sketch how our discussion of Pfister's, uh, Pfister theory leads to this uh, effective version of Hilbert's 17 problem. So, so let me just say theorem. So every, this is Pfister's, every sum of squares is a sum of 2 power n squares in R x1, x2, x3. Okay, in fact, um, for uh, this is uh, Pfister. If for n equal to, uh, less than n equal to 2, essentially this goes back to Hilbert himself, who proved that every sum of, sum of squares in R x5, for instance, is a sum of at most four squares. It was already uh, uh, known um, as a result of Hilbert. So beyond that, <coughs> so um, let me just uh, sketch uh, uh, a proof of uh, Hilbert's uh, bound. Um, in fact, what uh, Pfister proves is the following uh, more general uh, theorem from which the above assertion follows. So you take um, Rx uh, function field in n variables, more than you don't need to take uh, uh, rational function field, function field in n variables over R. And then if uh, uh, phi is any n fold Pfister form, then phi represents all sums of squares. Okay, so in fact, uh, when you try to prove just for sums of squares that everything is sum of 2 power n squares, you get into an inductive step where you, such a statement is required. So what he proves is that if you take any n fold Pfister form, essentially it is universal for values which are sums of squares. In particular, if you take phi to be 1, 1 tensor uh, uh, n, uh, the standard uh, 1, 1, 1 form, 
the assertion says that every sum of squares is a sum of 2 power n squares. Okay, so to just have a sketch of the proof, I'll need this following uh, proposition, which is uh, something technical about Pfister forms, which I didn't do earlier. Suppose phi is an n fold Pfister form. So you know that we can write phi as uh, 1 uh, a1 tensor 1 a2 in some form. And then the question, this is generally also denoted by a1 a2 a n with a double bracket the Pfister form. You would like to know what are all the possible AIs that can be interpolated into expression of a Pfister form. Okay, So it is not random, so it is not just values but some special values. So the assertion is that you can write phi as it always Pfister form always represents 1. So there is a Pfister neighbor, the supplement of orthogonal complement of 1. Let us call phi prime a Pfister neighbor of phi. Pfister neighbor of phi. Okay, you take off 1 from it and the orthogonal complement is the Pfister neighbor. So if phi <coughs> is a value of phi prime, then you can just insert b into this expression of uh, phi in the Pfister form uh, expression. Then phi is can be written as b b b2 dot 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 bn. Okay. The, some value can be interpolated in this expression provided it is a value of the Pfister neighbor of phi. Okay, whatever is represented by the orthogonal complement of the form phi. Okay, so now let us uh, run over the, the proof, I mean, at least uh, part of the proof of Pfister's theorem. Proof of Pfister theorem. So let us start with phi, um, an n-fold Pfister form. And b is a sum of squares. So I want to show that b is uh, a value of phi to show. So this is again. So let us look at the small, uh, I mean, suppose you take a square itself in some sum of squares. Every square is represented by phi because one, uh, phi represents one. So every square is a value. In fact, every sum of two squares is a value. Let's check this first. Suppose b is b1 squared plus b2 squared. Okay, so you have this um, bi in this function field in n variables. Or, uh, or the reals. So when we go to complex numbers, what happens? So this is a this is a function field in n variables or complex numbers. This is a CN field, right? So this uh, every form in more than two power n variables is universal. So this phi certainly represents is is universal over CX or the comp when you just go to square root minus one, this form becomes universal because it is a form in two power n variables. So it represents certainly this, uh, so phi represents, I'll just say b1 plus um, i b2. Okay, I'll use the fact that it represents b1 plus i b2. Okay, so call this beta. Okay, for reasons uh, we can easily assume that beta is in C. Uh, and beta is not in R, otherwise the problem is simplified. Then I make the representation like this by vectors V plus beta W is B, where V W are in Rx uh, to power n. So these are values over R. These are in the underlying vector spaces or, or the reals. And then you are extending to the complex numbers by adjoining beta. Okay. So this is represented like this. And then this is the same as phi v plus beta squared phi w. I mean, this is beta. So beta is represented plus the associated bilinear form b phi of b w minus one times beta. Okay. So the associated uh, you have this expression. This is equal to zero. This is the polynomial satisfied by beta or or r x. So when you take the norm of beta, 
which is simply phi v by phi w. Okay. So norm of beta is by definition b1 squared plus b2 squared, which is a ratio of two values of phi. And this by Pfister's theory, phi is multiplicative. So this is phi of um, z. So the sum, every sum of two squares is indeed a value. This is a simple consequence that or when you go to a joint square root of minus 1, it is universal. Okay, from this you get this. Okay, then you pass on from 2 to n. So you suppose uh, induction on how many squares are needed to express your given element. So write b as a certain number of squares. And then scaling, you can always assume that this is of the form c1 squared plus c2 squared plus cm squared. So it is a sum of m plus 1 squares and by scaling you can assume it represents 1. Let me call it 1 plus c. Okay, Induction would give me that c is a value of phi because it is a fewer number of squares, it is a value. Therefore c can be written as phi is 1 plus phi prime, right? Phi prime is a fister neighbor. So this can be written as a square plus c prime where c prime is a value of phi prime. So I want to show b is a value of phi. So I want to show that phi tensor 1 minus b is hyperbolic. This is all I needed to show because this would imply that phi is isomorphic to b times phi, which would mean that b is represented on the right hand side. So b is represented on the left hand side. So b is a value of phi. So I want to show that this is this form is hyperbolic. Let me call it c. Let me look at the Pfister neighbor of, uh, uh, this is C. Let me look at the Pfister neighbor of C. This is phi prime tensor 1 minus B, orthogonal minus B, right? 1 times this and I have to leave out 1. So this is precisely the Pfister neighbor of C. And let us look at the val uh, values represented by C prime. I find that C prime is represented by phi prime. So C prime minus B is a value of c prime but c prime minus b let me see what are these values this is c minus c naught square b is uh, <coughs> uh, 1 plus c so which is minus 1 minus c naught square okay so because this is a value of the fister neighbor c prime of c so c can be written as minus 1, minus C naught squared, minus 1, minus C naught squared, comma, tensored with another n-fold Pfister form C1. So when we expand it out, this is 1, minus 1, minus C naught squared, tensored with C1, which is C1 orthogonal, a negative of 1 plus C naught squared times C, C1. But no, the C1 is an n-fold Pfister form and it represents sums of two squares. That's what we have seen. So 1 plus C0 squared is therefore a similarity for C1. Okay, this is the basic property of Pfister forms that values are the same as similarity factors. So this is the same as C1 orthogonal minus C1, which is C0 in the width group. All right. So you get that every... Uh, Every sum of squares is in, uh, in fact represented by every n-fold Pfister form. So corollary, every sum of squares is the sum of squares in Rx is the sum of 2 power n squares in Rx where uh, this is a function field in n variables that is transcendence degree of Rx over R is n. Okay, so in particular, when you take Rx1, X2, uh, Xn, every, uh, every sum of squares here is a sum of 2 power n squares. This leads to, uh, I mean, uh, an invariant called the Pythagoras number of a field which is denoted by P of K. So P of a field K, where P is the Pythagoras number. It 
which is simply defined as the least n such that every sum of n square every sum of squares is a sum of n squares is a sum of n squares in k so this is the definition of the pythagoras number and what we have just seen is that if you take p of r x1 x2 xn the pythagoras number is bounded by 2 to the n and uh, what is probably it is much more difficult to ask well, what is the precise value of these numbers the pythagoras numbers this is again an invariant associated to the field so when you take two variables we know it is bounded by 4 by hilbert and in fact we have this Mordskin polynomial polynomial which is um, so you can express it as a sum of squares in the rational function field this is positive semi definite but it is not a sum of three squares in the rational function field in two variables okay so you need at least four squares to get this so in fact therefore it is precisely equal to four the pythagoras number is precisely four so i think this is the best case known as far as um, uh, rational function fields are concerned so in fact when you go from rxy to three variables rxyz so we know that uh, this is bounded by 8 on the other hand there is also a lower bound which you can go up to 5 so in fact i'll explain this because it's interesting so if suppose you take k is formally real that is minus 1 is not a sum of squares like for instance reals or rationals and um, if p of k is n then p of kt at least jacks up by 1 so you cannot have it doesn't stay it, it at least increases by 1 why is it true suppose a is in k star and a is a sum of uh, vi square i less than or equal to n and um, cannot be expressed as n minus 1 squares expressed as a sum of n minus 1 squares because the Pythagoras number is n so you need at least for some element an expression like this where n is really required now if you take a plus t square uh, a plus t square in k in kt okay so this is a sum of squares in kt and i think it is a very nice exercise in algebra to check that this is a sum of n plus 1 squares you have generically added one more uh, square so then you cannot make it a sum of n squares is the is the conclusion it is a sum of n plus 1 squares and not a sum of n squares n squares okay this is a complete generality so from which it follows that because r x y the pythagoras number is 4 it will at least go up by 1 for r x y z and it is bounded by 8 by Pfister's theory and I think it is um, still very open which of these numbers can be the Pythagoras number of Rxyz it's already wide open and does not know okay so let me uh, let us look at um, the other fields of interest which are associated to maybe number fields for instance so you can take uh, uh, C x1 x2 xn or QP x1 x2 xn what happens in these cases so what are the possible Pythagoras numbers so we have discussed the case of real numbers where it is um, it is a consequence of Pfister's theory but in these cases this it's somewhat easier okay because these fields do not have an ordering and minus 1 is the sum of squares it is somewhat easier to see what the Pythagoras number how they are bounded in these cases in fact if <coughs> so more generally if k is a field and if s of k is finite the level is finite that is minus 1 is the sum of squares suppose s of k is n then p of k is either n or n plus 1 these are the only possibilities 
in part in particular if it is a non formally real field so the level is finite which is always a power of 2 so the value for pythagoras number is always 2 power n or 2 power n plus 1 so these are the only possibilities this is sort of very easy to show because if you take any a in case case transit non zero element then you have this expression Okay, and um, in fact, minus one is a sum of n squares, so plus sigma summation b i squared i less than or equal to n times the square a minus one by two. Okay, this is a sum of n plus one squares. Okay, so the possible values for the Pythagoras number they are precisely n or uh, n plus one if the field has <coughs> uh, finite level n. So in particular, level uh, the level being always a power of 2, p of k is of the form 2 power n or 2 power n plus 1. Okay, these are the limited choices for the values of Pythagoras numbers. And these are such examples, okay, because minus 1 is a square here. And minus one is the sum of squares in QP and therefore in these fields. <coughs> and you know that uh, minus one is the uh, sum of um, at most four squares here. So minus one is a square here. So this is less than equal to two. Right? So the level is one, therefore P is at most two and P is at most five here. Okay? So, <coughs> so now we have, I mean, since we are. Uh, number theorists in some sense we are not so much concerned about uh, real numbers we would like to know over the rational numbers what happens okay so natural question so what is um, p of for instance q x1 x2 x1 is it bounded by what is it bounded at all that is every sum of squares is it a sum of bounded number of squares and if so what are the estimates for this bound okay these are very natural questions natural questions because they have been considered for hundreds of years so in fact <coughs> if you take uh, the rational function field in one variable over q then p of qt is 5 this goes back to the beginning of the last century Landau and some Pochet for Q replaced by general number fields. This was known for a very long time. Maybe I'll still explain a quick way with what we have discussed, how to see that at least it is finite is easy to see. Okay, less than or equal to uh, eight, for instance, is uh, rather easy to see. Every uh, every sum of squares in the rational function field in one variable is in fact a sum of at most eight squares is not too hard. So for this. Let us look at the bit group of QT. So you have a map to the product of the completions. B running over all the places of Q. So you have this map from bit group of QT to bit group of QVT. And in fact, this is an injection. Okay, any quadratic form here, if it is hyperbolic in all completions, QV of T is in fact hyperbolic. So we have seen uh, similar kinds of things in the in the project group. In fact, this is a consequence of two facts. One is the Milner exact sequence for weight groups of rational function fields for W of QT, or in fact, W bit group of rational function field in one variable or any field. There is an exact sequence connecting the bit group of the rational function field, the bit group of the various residue fields at completions at uh, places corresponding to uh, the monic irreducible polynomials and so you just put together this exact sequence together with the residue fields are all finite extensions of q they are all number fields put together Hasek uh, minkowski's theorem for local global principle for a number field if you put these two things together then you get an injection of this uh, with group of qt into product of with group of qv of t as we runs over all the completions. Now we would, we would like to know um, 
whether every um, sum of squares in QT is a sum of um, at most eight squares. So F in QT. So F is the sum of squares. So I want to show it is a sum of at most eight squares. That means I take the threefold Pfister form. I want to show that this represents F. Therefore, which is the same as this one, this fourfold Pfister form is zero in W of QT. Okay. So this is what we want to show. F is the value is the same as this fourfold Pfister form is zero in the width group of QT. Now I look at it locally in W of QV of T for all places and what happens to this form then I can use the injectivity of the map. So if you take for instance the real completion RT there is no problem because in fact F is the sum of two squares. Okay, This is even width, width or whatever. So this goes to zero because F is the sum of two squares and of, of course our um, QP, QP of T what happens. So 1 1 tensor 3 is 0 in the width group of QP. So we all know this because one the form 1 1 1 1 is universal. So this threefold fold form, in fact every threefold fold form is split over the periodic field QP. So this form is already 0 in QP. So this maps to 0 in the width group of QPT for all, all primes P. And of course it goes to 0 in RT. Therefore this by the the injectivity theorem which I just stated with group to the local weight groups, it follows immediately that this form is 0 over 1 minus f is 0 in the width group of qt. So which says that the Pythagoras number of qt is less than or equal to 8. In fact, there is no, there is no harm in replacing the rational function field Q by any number field. Essentially the same argument goes through to say that the Pythagoras number is at most 8. Okay, so so uh, and we have the following conjecture of Pfister. that um, um, k is a number field. And kx function field in d variables over k. Then first the Pythagoras number of kx is 5 if D is um, less than equal to 5, D is 1, and the Pythagoras number of kx for surfaces onwards it is bounded by 2 power d plus 1, d is at least 2. So these are the bounds, expected bounds for the Pythagoras numbers of function fields over number fields. Okay, so already the first uh, case which is open is for general curves. Okay. We just said if you take rational function field, we know the answer. But uh, if you take a general curve or a number field, I think the best known result till today is that P of K of X is bounded by 6. So I have a preprint I mean, which is on Pop's website uh, giving a proof of this result. So, but still 5 is an open question so far. Okay, now let us take a, a, d, a dimension, uh, the transcendence degree at least greater than or equal to 2. See what happens here. Here there is a, a general machinery which with several conjectures built into it, which would imply Pfister's conjecture. Okay, you expect this is true. So I'll explain now uh, what is the mechanism which goes into uh, getting Pfister's conjecture out of certain other conjectures in this area. <coughs> so, there are more, I mean, some conjectures due to Kato. So, let me just uh, 
get back to fistophones. Suppose you take n fold fistophones for any n or any field whatsoever. Okay, I claim that Vygotsky's theorem says that it is it is it sits inside the Galo cohomology with Zemo two coefficients via these Milner maps A n s. Okay, so it says that on I n of k there is a subjection with kernel I n plus one. But when you restrict to n fold sister forms, actually it is an injection of sets. Why is this true? Suppose E n of phi 1 is E n of phi 2, where phi 1, phi 2 are n fold sister forms. Okay, then E n of the difference is 0. The difference goes to 0. But when you look at the difference, it is like the 1 plus Fister neighbor of E1 plus minus 1 plus the Fister neighbor of E2 and 1 minus 1 uh, gives nothing in the width group. So the anisotropic part of this is just the anisotropic part of E1 prime minus E2 prime. And what is the dimension of E1 prime minus E2 prime? It is 2 to the n plus 1 minus 2 because we have thrown out one hyperbolic plane and this has, has dimension less than or equal to 2 power n plus 1 minus 2. Okay. When you take two copies P1, this has dimension 2 power n plus 1, but we have thrown out one hyperbolic plane. So this has dimension 2 power n plus uh, 1 minus 2, but it is in the kernel of En. So Vygotsky's theorem says that P1 plus minus P2 belongs to I n plus 1 of k. That means that this this form phi 1 prime plus minus phi 2 prime belongs to i n plus 1 and what, what is its uh, anisotropic dimension? It is 2 power n plus 1 minus 2. Right? But this this is not sufficient. The anisotropic, so we have seen Arison Fister main theorem says that if phi is an i n of k, i n plus 1 of k say, then the dimension of the anisotropic part of phi has to exceed 2 power n plus 1. Two small dimensional forms cannot be in a high filtration of the weight group. So this is the content of the Arison Fister's theorem which we stated in the first lecture. So because of this, because it falls short of this uh, dimension, so this has to be the zero element. Okay, so it cannot be in that filter. Therefore, phi1 is equal to phi2. So the Vygotsky's theorem implies that from P and K to H and K, the map En is in fact an injection of sets. Okay, now let's come back to our function fields. Suppose K is a number field. And <coughs> So k x function field in d variables. Over k, and uh, the Fister's conjecture says that every sum of squares is a sum of at most two power d plus one squares. Okay, so you take uh, any f in k x, f a sum of squares. So we want to show the conjecture, Fister conjecture. So let me assume uh, that D is at least 2 because uh, whatever, I, mean, I don't have anything more to say for curves. So let's assume it is, we are in the case of surface or high dimensional varieties. So Fister's conjecture says that, so 1, 1 tensor D plus 1 tensor with 1 minus F is 0 in the width group of kx. That is f is a sum of 2 power d plus 1 squares. This is the thing one would like to show. So let me call this uh, call this form as c. This, uh, this is the question. Now this is an element of uh, p. This is a d plus 1 fist form and this is 1 fold. This is p d plus 2. So you have a we have a d plus 2 fold fister form which you would like to show is 0. 
Now you take its image in h d plus 2 of k of x and you know that it is an injection. Okay. So if, to show this as 0 is the same as showing in cohomology it vanishes. Now the Carter's conjecture concerns this map from h d plus 2 of k x to you take the completions at various places of the number field and you take the corresponding function fields and you take product over p in the places of k. All places of k, you go to the completions of k and look at the corresponding function fields. So you have this map from hd plus 2 to the local hd plus 2. So Carto's conjecture, this is a conjecture of Carto. is that this map is, is injected. Okay. So, and uh, the known cases for Carter's conjectures are precisely So if dimension, uh, so I'll just uh, repeat h d plus 2 of k x to product h d plus 2 of k v of x, v runs over the places of omega. Okay, this injectivity is the conjecture. So of course we recognize this as uh, something very classical. In the case when dimension x is 0 for instance, what does it give? It just says that d equal to 0 says that h2 of a number field to h2 of the local completions product, this is injected. So this is the classical hasse brauer neuter theorem that injectivity in the bit group from the global uh, sorry from the global brow the brow group to the local brow groups this is an injection okay for d equal to 1 in fact carto's theorem carto himself proves this it's a theorem of god the conjecture is proved in the case of curse by carto himself and in fact, um, in an appendix to the paper of Carto, uh, Kulotelin explains how this kind of questions could lead to effective bounds for sums of squares in Rashi function fields or number fields. Okay. So, and then um, for d equal to 2, this is a theorem of um, Janssen. I don't know how to spell his name. <laughs> Is it correct? Janssen's theorem. So he proves that for surfaces, this map is indeed injected. Okay, so you get here the first new case that um, therefore this form. So what does it give? So psi, which is 1, 1, d is 2, um, tensor 3, d plus 1, tensor 1 minus f, maps 2. Okay, so Janssen's theorem says that, okay, let me just go back to what we need. So let us uh, use uh, Janssen's theorem, which is a solution of Carter's conjecture, uh, to show that we have some good effective bounds which solves Pfister's conjecture. So x is a surface over k, k is a number field, and f is a sum of squares in kx. So then I take, uh, I need to show that this tensor 3. So every sum of squares is a sum of at most 8 squares is what I want to show is 0 in the bit group of Ks. So we have this uh, P4 of Kx 
the fourfold fister forms, and then you have this injection to H4 of Kx, and then by Janssen's theorem, you have a further injection to product H4 of Kv of x as V runs over the places of omega. So it's enough to show that this fister form psi vanishes at this point. Okay. Now we have seen uh, already that Kv is uh, a periodic. Then when 1 1 tensor 3 is 0 in H3 of already in H3 of uh, Kv already. So this uh, 1 1 tensor 3 tensor 1 minus F is 0 in this H4. And over the reals, again Fister's uh, result says that over the real com completion, So f is a sum of 8 squares, in fact it is a sum of 4 squares right because it is a surface, so sum of 4 squares. So certainly therefore psi is 0 for v real place. And so, and of course, over complex places, what happens? H4 of uh, Kv of x, we complex place. So, this is a Kv is an algebraically closed field. This is a curve or algebraically closed field. H2 onwards, everything vanishes. This is 0. So, there's nothing much to check. So, C vanishes locally. In, um, in H4 of Kv of x for all v, which means by the theorem of Janssen, psi is 0, which in particular gives that f is the sum of 8 squares. Okay. So in particular, if you take Qxy, function field in two variables, then every sum of squares is the sum of at most a uh, sum of 8 squares. Okay. So P of uh, this field is bounded by 8. So in fact if you, I mean this is, I think this is the best known uh, concerning um, uh, this Pythagoras numbers, one doesn't know for three variables, whether this Carter conjecture is true or not, I think it's still open. So, if you'd like to say thank you.